Version Authority Finance Committee meeting. I'd like to welcome you all. Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dardis. Here. Dr. Mahoney. Mr. Peterson. I am here. Ms. Gayard. I'm here. Ms. Johnson. Here. Mr. Redlinger. Mr. Grimberg. Mr. Pepcorn. Here. Mayor Carlson. Mr. Reeds. Here. Ms. Madriga. Here. Mr. Steen. Here. The quorum is present. Thank you, Don. Item number two is to approve the minutes of December 14th, 2022. They have been distributed and have been in your packet. So on page three. Peterson, motion to approve. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Peterson, is there a second, please? Second. Commissioner Pipcorn's second has been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of December 14th, 2022 as distributed. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Item number three is to approve the order of the agenda. I'll make one note. Uh, the agenda that was sent out uh, last week uh, that was for your review, there is a uh, item B, uh, one and two, an update on insurance quotes. Mr. Shockley has uh, received those quotes and has those, and he would uh, present those today. So with, uh, I'd ask that uh, the, the agenda be amended to include items one and two under 8B. Again, I'm looking, Commissioner Steen. I move to approve the agenda as amended. Thank you, sir. Is there a second, please? Peterson, second. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. Been moved and second to approve the order of the agenda as amended. Uh, with uh, items 8B, 1, and 2. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Item number four, the approval of the bills. We'll call on Ms. Terry Gay Gayhart, excuse me, uh, Finance Director for the City of Fargo. The total of bills received through January 18th total $11,216,000. Cass County Joint Water Resource District has a bill for nearly $4 million. The City of Fargo is at $2.9 million. Magellan Pipeline has uh, bills in there for $2.4 million. And again, the City of Fargo at one6 And a few other sundries. Thank you, Ms. Gayhart. Is there any questions for the lady? Anyone? Questions? Don, would you please call a roll to approve of these bills? Point of order, Mr. Chair. I make a motion to approve, sir. <laughs> second. Been moved and seconded. Don, please call the roll. Mayor Dardis? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Aye. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Gayhart? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Redlinger? Yes. Mr. Pepcorn? Aye. Mr. Reitz? Yes. Ms. Madriga? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Item number five is a finance report. Again, we call on Ms. Gayhart uh, for that report. Um, as of 1231, we have $150,500,000 in cash and investments, two hundred and twenty-three, almost $224,000 in prepaid expense, Total liabilities are at $180,000, which brings our net position to $150,600,000. Thank you, Ms. Gayhart. Any questions for her regarding the finance report? A motion, please, to approve. Move to approve. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Is there a second, please? Steen, second. Commissioner Steen, who seconds. It's been moved and seconded to approve the finance report as presented by Ms. Gayhart. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <clears throat> carried. Item number six is the Executive Director Financial Report. We're going to call on Mr. Martin Nicholson for that report today, as Mr. Paulson is not with us. Mr. Nicholson. Thank you, Chairman Dardis, members of the committee. Um, first slide is the annual revenue status. Current month, um, approximately $33,400, bringing the fiscal year to date, $147,785,000, uh, and that was $33 million. Um, the uh, one note on this slide is the 
you'll see the current month for sales tax is zero. Uh, everyone should be aware of those lag by at least a month at the end of the year. And so when those receipts do come in, you'll see that sales tax number for fiscal year 22 climb to probably pretty close to what the uh, budget was, which is around 58,000, 59,000 for uh, the planned sales tax receipts. Next slide is the uh, overall status level one summary. The uh, uh, cost to date in 2022 is uh, roughly $111 million against the budget of 194,839. Um, remaining balance in 2022 of around 83 million 700,000. Um, we can go through the level two information. Um, I won't go through any of the of the detail will stand for questions on that if you've had a chance to take a look at it. Um, one small note for next month's meeting, uh, Peg, if you could go to the contingency lines. Uh, whoops, right there. You'll note that uh, we have yet to allocate any contingency on the project, which is uh, extremely good news, but you will see some contingency uh, being applied next month. We have negotiated a um, uh, change order for the developer due to changes in the requirements for fish passage. And so you'll start to see next month some accounting for application of that contingency and the cost showing up under the line item appropriately for uh, where the payments are done. Uh, we expect that to be ultimately about three and a half million dollars for this event, 500 that will occur, uh, 500,000 which will occur next month and then three million when they get to construction sometime later this year. So any questions on any of the level two items? Happy to stand for Anyone? those. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Regarding the fish passage, does that resolve any outstanding issues that may come? Uh, I know where there was some debate with our friends at the Army Corps uh, regarding details, for lack of a better term. So. Does that change or to resolve whatever may be coming in our future, or is there something we can anticipate in addition to that? This resolves the uh, approach based on the design information and the requirements that, that were changed, actually not changed, but provided additional detail after the procurement. We still have to get through the process of design and final approval for construction and demonstrate that the uh, design will meet the ultimate requirements. There is a possibility for additional comments and and uh, changes to get it to that stage. So I would say this is step one. We have another step to get through final construction drawings. And we're working with both the developer and the Army Corps, correct? Excuse me? Is it, but we're, we're working as a team, right? So our, yes. Our P, yeah, okay. So the P3 developer and the Army Corps are all sort of pushing towards a final resolution towards this. Yes, those uh, final designs will be reviewed by the core and reviewed by the authority and we'll communicate those comments as a team. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything uh, else on level one or level two that Mr. Nicholson has went through? Okay, please continue. La last page is the uh, uh, final page of that, which is uh, budget summary for the diversion authority operations. Uh, cost to date of around 1.1 million uh, against the budget of 1255, giving a remaining budget of around $132,000. Any questions from Mr. Nicholson? That's, this is not an actionable item, it's uh, just uh, for information. Uh, Martin, would you please continue? Yes, um, we have one contracting action in front of the Finance Committee today for consideration, and this is the Braun task order. You may recall that this was uh, brought forward last month and uh, sent back for additional information. Um, this particular task order takes um, testing services through the duration of the uh, P3 contract in the channel. It is a contract that goes through 2026, and um, the length of the contract is, is a function of the uh, desire to have continuous service and the same team in the field evaluating the geotechnical uh, compaction and performance of the contractor. So you'll see on the second page, uh, if you look at the detail, there is a table that has an annual budget through 2026 
and uh, that table has been budgeted at 3% growth, but all annual increases have to come back to, through to Joel and, and have a discussion on an annual basis for what the actual increase will be, and the bills will be based on the actual, not the budget table. Move to approve. Is there a second, please? Mayor Mahoney moves. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to approve <clears throat> the contracting actions as presented by Mr. Nicholson. Uh, this is a actionable item and will be a roll call vote. Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Gayhart? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Redlinger? Yes. Mr. Pepcorn? Aye. Mr. Reeds? Yes. Ms. Madriga? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Item number eight is other business. We'll call on Mr. John Shockley. Uh, this is a MOU agreement actions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon. The first item we have is an MOU with North Cass uh, Water Resource District and the Diversion Authority. Uh, this is very similar to our other MOUs uh, regarding some crossings and some permit uh, and acquisition requirements with North Cass uh, Water Resource District. There's nothing unusual about this MOU. I can certainly ans answer any questions that you might have, but it is for the Stormwater Diversion Channel. Questions for Mr. Shockley, anyone? All right, thank you. Uh, the second item I have is an amendment to an existing MOU with Rush River Water Resource District. Uh, we are adding in a crossing over an existing drain for some farm access. And so this is uh, uh, helping with some of the uh, land that's being divided up as part of the right-of-way acquisition. And it is also uh, allowing some acquisitions or acquisition access to those parcels. And so it's a pretty straightforward amendment. That's the only thing it addresses. Questions on this item? Thank you, Mr. Shockley. This is an actionable item. Uh, so I would need a motion on item number A1 and A2, or do, do them individually. Your pleasure. I'll make a motion to approve both of them, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Pipcorn. Is there a second, please? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. Been moved and seconded to approve the MOU agreements as presented by Mr. Shockley, North Cass, and Rush River. Don, would you please call her all? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Gayhart. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Pepcorn. Aye. Mr. Reeds. Yes. Ms. Madriga. Yes. Mr. Steen. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Next order of business under other business is the update on insurance quotes. Again, we call on Mr. Shockley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first, uh, maybe a little bit of background. So as part of the project uh, planning, we had uh, anticipated that as structures would come online that we would be acquiring insurance for what are referred to as latent defects during construction. So in North Dakota, there's what is referred to as a statute of repose. And so if there is an injury or a failure of one of the structures that occurs within 10 years after substantial completion, there's an opportunity to come back on the owner or potentially the engineer or some combination thereof that there was an de inherent design defect or some similar type of action that caused damage to someone. Um, this damage could also be to the owner. And so as a result, as part of the insurance package, we'd looked at how are we going to ensure these structures from these types of claims? Um, this type of claim is not covered by our North Dakota Insurance Reserve Trust Fund, specifically excluded. Uh, that's more of a property and liability insurance. So this really covers damages that would be a result of structure failures, things like that. And so we, when we started looking at the insurance coverage, we tried to divide the project up into two uh, components, one the P3 channel, and one, the southern embankment. As the Corps has been completing portions of the southern embankment, uh, they will start handing over infrastructure to the Diversion Authority uh, to own and operate. 
And that's really when our liability comes into place. And so uh, it, the importance of getting this done, we wanted to get it done this year. And so we went out to the market uh, kind of with a couple of goals. Number one is we wanted to make sure there was capacity in the insurance market to handle all the infrastructure that comes online because the Southern Embankment, it's not just one structure, it's multiple structures that will start coming online throughout the next six years. And so working with our insurance advisor, Aon, uh, we were able to put together an insurance package that will cover all of those structures. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of these items. Um, what we're looking for from the Finance Committee is a recommendation for the Executive Director and myself to go forward with binding the coverage based upon the quote. And so the insurance coverage, we wanted to make sure it can handle what the insurance uh, companies are able to handle all of that infrastructure coming online because at the end of the day, it'll be about $750 million in infrastructure on the south side of town, which is quite a large uh, uh, asset to insure in the open market. We also wanted to make sure that the defense coverage, the cost of defending claims were outside of your policy limits. So for example, let's say that you had a $50 million policy, but out of that $50 million, every time you have a claim, your attorney's fees come off of it, $50 million of coverage really doesn't amount to much then because every time there's a claim, it eats away at your policy limits. And so uh, with that in mind, um, Aon went out to the market. Uh, we spent a significant amount of time gathering information and data from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, because their contractors, their contracting actions, their claims, their history claims, all had to go into uh, the applications for the open market. And so Aon was able to price out uh, with a number of providers um, they're on the, I believe they're on the phone if you need some additional background. Uh, but the insurance coverage uh, is a payment, a one-time payment that covers the full uh, five years of construction plus um, the 10 years of statute of repose. It has a $25,000 deductible. The cost of insurance defense is outside of the policy limits, which is primarily where I think our costs would come from, people making claims against the infrastructure. We don't want our policy limits eaten up by uh, the uh, uh, cost of defense. Also in North Dakota, there are statutes of limitations on how much as an entity we would have to pay out for a claim. And so that all rolled into the insurance coverage. So currently they would be providing coverage for uh, the uh, Diversion Inlet, Wild Rice Inlet, Red River Control Structure, the I-29 Rose Rays, SE1A and SE2A, which are all expected to come online pretty soon. As those additional southern embankment uh, projects are bid out, uh, we can then put that into a second tranche. Currently, that's about a $305 million asset. Uh, and then the, uh, it would, they're not going to have any exclusion for prior works, which is a really big deal. So even though we'd be binding coverage this year, if there was a latent defect in the work in 2019, they'll still provide coverage for that, which is ideal because we don't have some arbitrary date at which they'll say they will get in an argument about when the defect occurred. So the total cost for that whole policy, and I understand it's bigger numbers, but we are dealing with very large assets. It's 2,143,000 and some change. Um, this is a budgeted item that we had budgeted for long term, and it's within that budget. And so what we would be looking for is uh, authorization to go forward, buying these quotes. We can report back more if you really want to deep dive into insurance. More than happy to do it, but don't know how many people are really that interested in the deep dive into it. Happy to answer any questions, and then I'll discuss the P3 channel insurance. Any discussion on this? Commissioner Pipcorn. So, Mr. Chair, I don't have I don't want to deep dive into insurance, but I do have a question for you. So, the the control structures are being built by the core, correct? And so, it's going to be on them until they're completed, and then they will turn it over to us. Is that the concept? And then we have to make sure that there's insurance once that happens. Is that what you would say? Correct. And the the interesting part uh, is that the core only covers a million, take, uh, holds a million dollars of insurance during construction. 
Uh, they don't have the uh, defects insurance, the latent defects, because under federal law, there are certain protections given to the core, and there are also um, different federal rules regarding when you can and can't sue the federal government. So they they have an entirely different insurance program than uh, somebody like the authority, where we control the asset. We're primarily going to be the one that somebody would try to sue. Can I just have one more follow-up, Mr. Chair? So, but my main concept is, I mean, we're going to know when it, it's turned over to us that it's that it's operational and things like that. So I guess the, my question is, what what are we insuring? Is it for if somebody was injured, or, or can you talk a little bit about that? So this would be uh, what is referred to as a latent defect, and Martin could tell you all, probably sort, all sorts of stories about latent defects in construction. You may not see them when you turn that on. I'll use an absurd example. So you have a structure that is holding back water. It breaks, uh, and it's uncovered that it was a latent defect in either the engineering or the construction. Um, Normally, the engineer or the contractor would be sued within those 10 years, but because the federal government constructed it, they're going to say it's the local sponsor's responsibility unless you can meet certain thresholds under federal law. Even if, even if they did sue the Corps, they'd probably sue us too. So just having that protection to provide coverage for the attorney's fees, that in itself is a big deal. So. I don't know, Martin, if you can have an example of a latent defect. No, no, I think you've, I think you've done a good job, John, of explaining that. One example on, these, on this particular project, you know we have very big, very um, complex tainer gates. Those gates have a lot of welds on them. If you have a failure five years from now and it's discovered that the weld was actually uh, latently bad, that's the coverage that you're buying. You're, you're buying for problems that were not obvious when you installed it. They're discovered later. Nothing you could have done about them because you didn't know about them. That's the insurance you buy. Okay. All right. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, when I read this on the agenda, I thought it was like owner's risk. So I'm glad you explained it to me because it's clearly not in any which way or form owner's risk, correct? It's an it's a owner's interest general liability insurance. Perfect. Thank you. And this will sit in addition, because right now we have insurance through the North Dakota League of Cities that would cover what I would call your traditional, um, if somebody trips and falls, breaks their leg, they'll cover those sorts of claims, but these are excluded from the current policy. Any additional questions? We're going to take these one at a time, so uh, a motion, please, for item 8B. One. Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion. Thank you, Commissioner. Second. <clears throat> Pipcorn. Is there a second? Commissioner Peterson, second. Been moved and seconded to approve uh, the insurance quote for structures completed prior to and substantial completion in 2027 as presented by Mr. Shockley. Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Gayhart. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Redlinger? Yes. Mr. Papcorn? Aye. Mr. Reeds? Yes. Ms. Madriga? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Ms. Everyone? Thank you, Don. Don uh, John? Mayor, yes. Mayor Dardis? Um, uh, this is Mayor Carlson. I am on now, and I would um, vote yes as well. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome. John, would you please proceed with the defects P3 channel litigation? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And the, it actually should be entitled Owner's Interest General Liability Insurance for the, the, P, the P3 channel. Um, this is a very similar insurance product and maybe a little better background. Under the P3 contract, we require the developer to carry $100 million of insurance coverage um, for these types of claims. And so we're necessarily concerned about the amount of the actual claim uh, because there's a lot of insurance there. Um, so we're looking for a reasonable amount of additional policy coverage. But here, the same thing uh, uh, came to, into play where we wanted to make sure that the uh, attorney's fees were outside of the policy limits because we're probably like, if there's a claim against the developer, we'll probably get brought into it. And having the coverage for the attorney's fees in a complex litigation, 
you could easily see millions of dollars in attorney fees. And so very similar policy, it sits, but this one sits behind the P3 developer's uh, insurance policy. Um, and if we were sued in addition to the P3 developer, this would also come into play. Um, this has the same type of insurance coverage. It's uh, 10 years after, this, uh, after substantial completion. So we're estimating 2027 substantial completion. So you'd have uh, coverage through 2037 uh, through the end of the statute of repose. Um, and it is also a one-time uh, uh, premium um, with the $25,000 deductible where the attorney's fees are outside of the policy limits. Um, there is no exclusion for prior works. Um, so once again, that's an advantage. Um, there's, uh, this only has about $14 million per occurrence, which I think is fine because we have the uh, coverage from the contractor, um, uh, P3 contractor's insurance uh, to cover quite a significant amount. So for me, it was more about can this cover the attorney's fees in any type of a claim. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's uh, a total of three million four seventy seven for the premium. Uh, once again, this was a budgeted item. This covers the full value of the diversion channel capital costs, which would include all the county bridges, uh, claims on the county bridges, claims on the aqueducts, claims on the channel, any type of claim in which we could be brought in um, regarding a, a latent defect or construction defect, which I, I think there's probably, you know, with bridges, county bridges, people traveling across there, if there's an accident, there's probably a reasonable opportunity for somebody to bring a claim. And that covers the total value of $1.3 billion, so it is a large chunk of uh, uh, insurable asset that we'd be covering. Um, I wanted to treat them separately because um, you already have the coverage with the or with the P3 contractor, but I, I think it would be prudent to also have this insurance coverage if nothing else than to cover the attorney's fees. But um, it, it's ultimately a, a finance committee and a board decision, so I wanted to make sure everybody was on board with going ahead and securing this insurance. Thank you, Mr. Shockley. Questions? Anyone? Move to approve. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Is there a second, please? Steen seconds. Thank you, Mr. Steen. Been moved and seconded. Uh, for approval of the owner's interest P3 channel litigation insurance. Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dartis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Gayhart. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Pepcorn. Aye. Mayor Carlson. Yes. Mr. Reeves. Yes. Ms. Madriga. Yes. Mr. Steen. Yes. And that is everyone. Thank you, Don. As you recall, last month, item number uh, C now is with regard to election of a vice chair. And uh, I wanted to announce that with the retirement of Dan Jacobson last month, Cass County Joint Water Resource District has appointed Mr. Rick Steen to take that position, which we're delighted to hear that he'll be a continued part of this discussion. Um, with that being said, uh, I'm going to... Uh, using the chair's discretion, and I'm going to put in nomination that Mr. Steen continue as the vice chairman of the finance committee, and I hope for a second. Second that nomination. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. It's been moved and seconded that Mr. Rick Steen be... Uh, in his new position, going to request he's kind of a watchdog over Bernie Dardis. Uh, that's right. Something he, we could add to his duties. And this is the right man for the job. Uh, we have a, a motion and a second. Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Gayhart. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Pepcorn. Aye. Mayor Carlson. Yes. Mr. Reeds. Yes. Ms. Madriga. Yes. Mr. Steen. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Moving on. City of Fargo work plan and projects in 2023. Calling Mr. Chris Bachegaard. Welcome. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, today I have another update on you on the, for the City of Fargo work plan uh, for their 23 work related to the River Stage 37 projects. 
Um, they're intending to bid two projects packaged into one bid for uh, two sanitary sewer lift stations. Um, they're working on final easements for that, and then we'll proceed to bid uh, hopefully in the next uh, month or so. Uh, one thing that has happened, um, like we faced a little bit last year, is um, from the first time we did these estimates, uh, the bid environment and the inflationary costs have, have risen quite substantially. Uh, so today I'm here just to report and, and ask for your support for increasing our budget on this particular line item. Uh, right now in, in the original plan we had about $6.2 million for this particular phase of work. Um, right now the engineer's estimate is estimated at just a little over $11 million. Again, just as a reminder, this is still the same scope of work that was approved in the original work plan, uh, just an escalation of individual bid items and, and costs. And if you want any more detail, I have certainly Nathan's here can help me with um, questions on that. Um, and then, uh, so that's really what we're looking for today is a recommendation for the board to approve the budget increase of about $4.8 million. Um, so with that, I'll entertain any questions, or if you want any more details, we can we can dive in. Thank you, Mr. Bakkegaard. Anyone questions, Commissioner Peterson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any any possibility this would be a recurring theme in terms of inflated values ongoing? Obviously, this is the finance board here, so I'm curious as to find out how uh, secure we are going forward regarding other projects. Yeah, I, I can give my thoughts on it. Uh, maybe, Nathan, if you want to weigh in a little bit. I, I certainly think in the current bid environment, there, there likely will continue to be some escalation of costs. Obviously, that can change um, in, in the marketplace over the next few years. So, you know, right now, we're certainly not, uh, not in a mode of updating every budget um, to date, but certainly something that we're watching. I believe these are the only two projects we're planning to bid this year. Yeah, no, you are correct that the 2018 numbers we used at the time when Plan B was originally developed with the, all the inflation costs we have experienced over the last handful of years, the remaining lift station costs will be higher than what we originally anticipated. So in putting together our budget, as I'm looking at Mr. Nicholson, uh, this is obviously nibbling into contingency, right? I presume it would nibble into contingency. Uh, what should we be looking forward to in the next three to five years? So th thank you, Commissioner Peterson. Uh, that's a good question, and there's a lot of unknowns uh, with respect to whether or not the recent increases we've seen are going to continue. Uh, th there is a, a fair amount of work left to be done. If you go back to the level two detail, you can see that for um, the River Stage 37 projects, we've got about $67 million worth of work left to go. So that amount is subject to um, inflation and cost increases. The, the other large bucket that is yet to be spent is inlands. So there's roughly $200 million worth of flow easements and the rest. Uh, it's not subject to the same kind of inflationary pressures as construction projects are, but those represent the largest kind of uncommitted uh, budgets that are yet to be uh, allocated through through contracts. So at, at the moment, we've had some good bids within that River Stage 37 in-town project that has allowed us to continue without accessing contingency for this budget increase. But we've obviously got um, our eyes on that and we'll be looking at adjusting some of those numbers and, and bringing those forward if we believe we'll exceed our contingency amount and get into those contingency numbers. There is in the contingency pool, as I said, we've, uh, we'll be starting to access that next month, but there is um, 164 million roughly in contingency financed in the finance plan. And so that remains available to handle both, land, well, all all aspects of contingencies for the project. So we do have some contingency. Uh, we haven't accessed it yet. Uh, it's a great question to keep an eye on as we look to bid the rest of those construction projects and see where our lands ends up coming in. Mr. Chair, can I continue one quick? Please. Thank you. Um, so much like my question regarding schedule, when do we start to worry? I'll follow that with the exact same question here. When do we start to worry? So 
Sorry, Martin. Uh, Commissioner Peterson, it's always a great time to worry about finances. <laughs> I, I, I think um, when we get an opportunity to um, uh, visit, and I will, I will go back with Nathan and with the PMC team, and we'll take a look at the construction projects and, and potentially what we should do is come back with some scenarios and how that might look with respect to contingency. Um, I think another year under our belts of bidding with the in-town projects, these next two bids will be informative. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But it's something we're obviously looking at, and it's probably prudent to come back to the Finance Committee with some scenarios about what that might look like and what our contingency about might look like. What I've always done is sort of catastrophize with clients. My worst case is X, you know, under promise, over deliver. So I'd be curious to find out what happens to this budget if catastrophe transpires over three years. Thank you. Yeah. So the one thing I'd add, Commissioner Peterson, is that, you know, we are trying to have all our lift stations done by 2027. So I was actually looking at it here just this afternoon of maybe we start looking at delaying a couple projects, which may go against inflation, but make sure that we're not overloading the contractors as well, which could drive up the prices too. So that's something we're very closely watching to make sure that we're getting appropriate number of bids and not overworking the contractors that would, could inflate prices unnecessarily. That is a great idea. Mr. Bernardo, I have a question. And you're reviewing a city projects or any projects that you deal with. Uh, do you see the increases in uh, labor or do you see it in materials or and or, or is there is there a, a common? Uh, it seems like it's for the citywide. It's kind of across the board. Um, labor is definitely one. Trucking costs is one as well. That's seen really large increases lately. But I know uh, another engineer in our office made a comment. Uh, DOT recently bid out a few mill and overlay projects and the asphalt per ton there was about $100 per ton on that one. And as recently as two years ago, that was about $60 per ton. So we are seeing a large increases all across the board. Yeah. Mayor Mahoney. Yeah, Commissioner Peterson's comment, <clears throat> I guess what we'd like to look at is if we accelerate the build versus, and we've done this in the city too, give too many projects, prices all go up to, to a balanced group. But could we look kind of at a risk-benefit type of scenario of if we did it sooner, if we delay, or, or what your thoughts would be to get uh, the best of the, if you build now, maybe it's your price and lose the inflationary comment. But if you... Uh, I know one year in the, we had a huge amount of projects, City of Fargo, the next year we had less, and our prices went down, which was nice. So I guess I'd kind of like to have a, a guess of maybe do it before 27, or like you said, delay it and see what we got. I know when I've uh, reviewed city projects and the like in, in our community, uh, when to start worrying, it's past that. I believe this is the new norm, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a lot of reasons, but there's an opportunity for them to, uh, when they were se severely hampered during COVID, and I think some of these companies are are uh, making up for lost revenues and the like. I, I just believe that that's the case because if you take a look at some of the valves and things like that that go into a lift station and the like, it's amazing uh, how that particular item has increased in in uh, cost so yeah and that's one thing too of how we changed our lift station projects as well so like the one we're bidding out today a couple years ago we were required a construction completion date of this fall we're allowing them all next summer as well so we're opening it up to you know you contractor you fit it in your schedule as appropriate and hopefully that opens up the pool of bidders more, but also allows them to fit it in their schedule easier too and hopefully keep those prices lower. It's a good thought. Well, we have before us an actionable item at the City of Work, City of Fargo Work Plan for 2023. And as uh, presented by Mr. Bakkegaard, it's a total budget increase of $4,808,250. Moved to approve. Mayor Mahoney, thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Steen seconds. Mr. Steen seconds. Been moved and seconded to approve the City of Fargo work plan.
projects for 2023. Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Gayhart. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Rellinger. Yes. Mr. Pepcorn. Aye. Mayor Carlson. Yes. Mr. Reeds. Yes. Ms. Madriga. Mr. Steen. Yes. And that is everyone. Commissioner Steen. Uh, thank you. Before we move into your next meeting, I just had a question for whoever's involved. Is so we've got all these inflated rates, and we know we're going to be hit in in the bids. Has anybody done an analysis of what this is going to do to sales tax revenue? We got everything's going up in price. People are paying more for everything they buy. It's got to come back to us somehow in sales tax revenue. Commissioner Peterson. Commissioner Steen. Yes. As I look at Ms. Madriga, uh, I have been peppering her lately with those with those numbers, and we actually just got a preliminary report. Sales taxes are accelerating in Ms. Madriga. You want to share what we know? I don't recall them offhand, but I believe that it it was up about um, what was it two hundred thousand over the last year. Um, but as as uh, the cost of items go up. But we haven't done a formal analysis on what we would expect in 2023. Numbers? <laughs> I think that Mayor Mahoney thinks that Ms. Gayhart might have some in uh, in information for us. I, I don't know what to tell you other than you're going to be bringing in a lot of construction workers as well as these construction costs, and you're going to have... Um, I think a, a significant impact on the sales tax, but I can't tell you what that is. I think county is four and the city is 12%. I think we have the number, Mayor. And I did. I just don't have it on my station. Brian, could you pull the mic closer when you talk? Thank you, Robert. For those people watching online, Mr. Robert Wilson, the county administrator, has provided his laptop to, to Brandy to look at the, the sales tax revenues. Uh, so the sales tax revenue for 2022 was uh, 21 point, uh, almost 2 million, and that was up about uh, 300,000 over the prior year. Um, so I would expect it would go up as well in 2023. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the news that uh, Mr. Nich Nicholson, our deputy executive director, said regarding contingencies, contingencies, you know, all of the things considered, whether it's the uh, sales tax revenues that we have coming in or, or continuing to monitor some of these, the bids that are coming in and the, uh, the increases that are going to, uh, you know, again, the uh, finance committee in, in, in the past has been kind of the caretaker of the contingency fund. And, you know, uh, I, I know that one of the dialogues has always been that we don't know what it's going to cost us to operate this at the end of the project. So there's why contingencies were, were in order. So we have to continue. I'd, I'd encourage the finance committee that we continue to uh, evaluate that on a month-to-month -month basis as to what's going to be happening because, you know, some of these bids were uh, in 2018 dollars and now here we are in 2023 and uh, we're seeing the significant increases. So that being said, our Commissioner Steen. Thank you. So not even a commissioner anymore. I, I, I can <laughs> I continue to catch myself. So anyway, uh, the, the thought there was just thinking because we've got you know, so much of our of our costs are fixed. They've been bid out. It's the core. It's the P3, whatever. It'd be interesting to know what what's our exposure to the inflation. I mean, it's not because it's not three million. It's we've already spent approximately half of that. We've got a lot of our costs in P3. We've got a lot of our costs in core costs. So, be nice to know what what somebody can do this. I'm sure much quicker than I can. What our exposure is as far as inflation. You know, give us come up with a number. What we think. Use worst case scenario. Whatever you want to do. Some ranges. And then do the same thing with the revenue side. I think that'd just be a, a pretty good exercise for the finance committee to say, you know, we've looked at this. Here's what it is, and if there's a risk, let's ID, identify what it is, if, and that type of thing. I know John probably has a lot of insight into that. So we'll call on Mr. Shockley to respond to Mr. Steen. Well, uh, um, 
Member uh, Steen, I'm not necessarily going to answer that question. You ask what the biggest risk for cost increases to the project are. I, I would be remiss if I did not mention that at the legislature right now, there are bills under consideration to require the condemning authority to pay 33% above the fair market value for land uh, during an eminent domain proceeding. Um, as a result, it is likely that property owners would not negotiate and instead go to court, or it would force all of our offers to go up by 33%. Um, that is, frankly, an amount that we really hadn't taken into account. We hadn't taken into account a that drastic of a change of law that we would add 33% to the, essentially to the fair market value of all the land purchased. So in, in my opinion, if you're asking where our risk is for use of contingency, um, those types of changes have are most impactful to the project. We've, we've bid out the P3. The core has been uh, fairly accurate on its, uh, uh, its budgeted items. It's taking on some additional scope. We've done a good job of managing the things that we can manage. That's something that we can't manage. So I guess if, if you have any opportunity to talk to your legislators, let them know that would be a drastic change to our budget. And we would likely have to go ask for additional money at the state legislature to uh, have to deal with that bill. Mr. Steen, go ahead. Well, I, I would just say I, not asking you to come up with something off the cuff, but I think it's something we should definitely explore in this next year once we know what's happening. And, and you know, and not the minutiae that we've had to go through in the past, because, but I think that the, the, the big picture look at here's some numbers we should be looking at. And, you know, back to Mr. Peterson's questions, when do we have to worry? Being, you know, I don't disagree with the mayor, but it's like we, we should know how much we're worrying about, maybe. And that would be just nice. I just think we, the finance committee should ask Jacobs and, and John, you to go back at some point when it's appropriate this year to say, here's, here's our latest rendition of our, of our program costs. You know, so we can look at the financial plan, including the revenue increases, and say, well, how much do we have to worry about? Okay. Like. Thank you. Commissioner Pipcorn. I, I, he, that just brings up the topic. I mean, should we have a letter from the Diversion Authority to the legislature testifying, saying what this impact of this proposed bill would be on the diversion and our costs? So I, I think that's maybe we should put that on the agenda for the Diversion Authority or something like that. But I, I guess that's the whole thing. You know, you debate about us being involved, lobbying with uh, the state legislature, but to pass on this impact no, and what it could be, I think it, it would be good because a lot of people, I don't think, realize uh, what the impl implications could be to the to the diversion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Nicholson. Yes, uh, we, we had a conversation with um, Joel and Jody earlier today, and I think Jody has a response with respect to an approach for just that topic. So I would, I would say I'm watching all of the eminent domains fairly closely. I think the press has been following them in the Fargo and Forum. Um, they've been deemed the NIBI bills, not my backyard bills. There's approximately 10 eminent domain bills. Um, we have passed the time where they can continue to introduce bills, so I think this should be it. Seven of those bills do open up Chapter 32-15, which is the chapter that we use to file eminent domain. I wouldn't say necessarily that I'm concerned about all of the bills. A lot of them don't apply directly to our project. However, once a chapter is open, even if some other bills disappear, it does open it up um, for exposure with us. What we're going to do is kind of dig back into the lands numbers. So obviously when, when the budget was created, um, there was some inflation built into that plus the contingency, which you guys saw in your budget earlier today. Uh, we certainly don't have 33%. My assumption would be it would be above 33% because uh, we would get the appraisal. They would say inflation this past year for most of the land is 28% plus you'll add the 33% above that. So the exposure is actually quite significant. Um, it would apply probably to current ongoing eminent domain cases and future cases. Um, we're not sure you know, if the courts would uh, retroactively apply the statute, even if all the eminent domain cases were filed before August 1st, when this would go um, into uh, full application for us. So 
Again, what we're going to do right now is I'm going to reach out to some of the legislators that I worked closely with in my previous job, um, see the impetus of this bill, kind of where is this bill coming from, um, and at the same time we're going to be pulling some of those numbers so that we can formally educate them and also bring something back to the this committee and probably the full board in, in the future about what the implications of this bill could be. And again, the significant impact would be on the lands budget well above and beyond what we have contingency built into our budget for. All right, Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the origins are Emmons County, but that can, I think we probably all know that. But uh, I think in lieu of the diversion sending a letter, I think the Water Coalition should. This will be impactful to any project statewide. And I, I think the broader perspective, I don't think it has any traction anyway, but I think it would be remiss if we didn't address that. And I think, again, I think the Water Coalition is sending out the diversion. Because whether it's us, it's Minot, Lisbon, Jamestown, everyone will be impacted by this. This Minot's a $1.4 billion or $6 billion project too. You know, it's not small. So this would be impactful, maybe not equally to us, but I bet we'd be shocked what this number would do to their acquisition up in Minot. So that's what, I, that's what I'd recommend. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, so we'll count on staff and, and Ms. Smith to be uh, monitoring those, uh, the ramifications of that uh, North Dakota legislature legislation. So our next meeting will be February 22nd. Okay, does any member of the Finance Committee have anything else that they'd like to bring forward this evening? Mr. Nicholson. Hi, Chairman Dardis, members of the committee, I just want to uh, kind of wrap that discussion up with respect to coming back to the Finance Committee with some perspective on inflation and our revenues. I think I heard uh, Mr. Dean say um, after the legislative session, I think that's an appropriate time frame when we understand what has actually happened with respect to any bills that might affect the costs. And so I would be looking for mid-year-ish to be able to have some reflection on the outcome of the legislature and then a look at our costs and a look at our revenues and have that have that discussion in front of the Finance Committee if that's acceptable. Thank you. Anyone else? Again, February 22nd is our next Finance Committee meeting. We stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>